the uh, fact that all nine governors are participating this evening in, in honoring uh, Chairman Putney uh, shows the, the kind of respect that this man has, the kind of work he has done, and the, the, the dedication of the Commonwealth. Uh, Had, had lunch with the chairman and said, gee, do you think anybody will come? <laughs> we, uh, we said, yeah, we think so. And, and you all proved it tonight, and we, and we appreciate it. Um, the master of ceremonies this evening is, is the majority leader of the, of the House of Delegates, Kirk Cox. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here for Lacey's Tribute. My first job is introductions, which is always extremely dangerous. And so I'm going to ask uh, all the members of the legislature to stand. <laughs> Look at that. anyone from the Thomas Jefferson Institute Board who was so instrumental also to stand. So if there are any board members, if you would stand. Uh, let's give them a nice round of applause. And also a special thanks to Mike Thompson and the guy behind the scenes, Charlie Judd. They did a great job. So let's give yeah. them a nice round of applause. This is dangerous territory for me because no one's here to see a legislator. They're here to see all these distinguished governors. But I thought I would represent the legislative branch since we have so many people and talk a little bit about uh, our perspective of Lacey Putney because he's so special to us. So I'm going to start with a uh, joke, which is really a mistake, but I'll be in preparation. Guys are laughing, but you'll recognize this one. Um, being here tonight is like being a mosquito in a nudist camp. There is so much territory to cover, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> he gets a much better laugh out of that than I do. <laughs> but the first thing I want to start with is that the wonderful thing about Lacey Putney for us is he can put you at ease when he walks into a room. And that's the kind of thing he will say, and it's just amazing. He has a witticism for about everything that he does. A lot of you know about his 52 years of service. He's been chairman of Privileges and Elections, he's been speaker, he's been chairman of Appropriations. I've always said Lacey and Carmella are straight out of central casting. If you could take a movie maker and, and sort of put the ultimate delegate, that that's who you would pick. And they're such a gracious couple, he's the ultimate gentleman. Um, he always wears that suit. I went to a ball game with him. <laughs> I swear he has uh, and I was talking to Ned Massey, he said in a new part of his district, he was taking him through uh, one of the industries, and there was Lacey on like a 100 degree day with his tie on. And we laugh about that. But, you know, I used to always heard that Ronald Reagan would always go in with a suit in the Oval Office, and that's the kind of respect Lacey has for the office. Um, Lacey's the kind of person in my 24 years, which pales in comparison to 52, that when Lacey would stand on the floor of the House of Delegates, and he really didn't do it that often, I've always thought one of the most effective things you can do, boy, politicians like to talk. And, and we really do. A lot of people stand up all the time, and people really don't listen. And when Lacey stands up, it's because it really means a lot to him. And invariably, he always gives you a history of exactly when that bill was created. And Robert Vaughn and I were talking today about some examples. I remember there was a bill that came up a few years ago on the TAG program, the Tuition Assistance Credit, which, is, of course, is very big for the private colleges. And the bill sells out of committee. We're not paying attention. That's rare. And it's probably going to pass 100 to nothing. And Lacey stands up and he goes, well, in the 1960s when TAG was created, and literally walks through the entire program, it was a bill to expand TAG improperly. We listened to him. And the bill was defeated. And that probably has happened, I can't count on probably you know, one hand, how many times that's happened in the General Assembly. And whether it be a VRS bill or any bill like that, that's sort of Lacey Putney. He just always puts you at ease. I think the ultimate achievement, and I'm guessing for Lacey, was chairing the Appropriations Committee. 
That to me is, uh, that's the committee, let's face it. And he has been a wonderful chairman. He let me be his co-pilot, uh, his vice chairman, but I really was only the co-pilot. He was the leader. It's a lot of long hours and a lot of tension and preparations. It's, it's a tough job. And the great thing about him is, you know, when you're trying to get the House version of the budget done, it is just work, work, work. I mean, conference, John Walker, in conference. Conference is interesting. Dealing with the Senate is just great. Uh, we always trading friendly proposals back and forth. Uh, Senate's gone out to dinner. Uh, but Lacey really was the guy that got us through conference so many years. And uh, we just have a wealth of jokes and just things to keep us going. The thing I loved about him was, as a, you know, as a young member from when I just started, he would really have a lot of confidence in you. He would let the members do a lot of work, be creative, but make no mistake about it, if you're going the wrong direction, he can let you know. Because he had that kind of conviction. If you look at what we've accomplished, and I was uh, talking to Governor McDonald uh, the other day about, you know, I think an incredible four years. Uh, a lot is due to the governor, but also this man right here, who's our great leader. So, I just think he's a wonderful person. I want to end with this. I think the measure of the man is really how the people, he treats people, and especially people who work for him. And I hate to say the appropriation staff, you know, they're such professionals, but you see them all here tonight. Uh, each one of them would run up here eagerly and tell you a great story about how professional he is, how wonderful he's treated them. He lets them be creative. But they know he's the boss. We all know he's the boss. So he's a special guy. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. And now for the fun part of the, the program, we have a list of governors I don't think I've ever probably seen in one place before. And they're going to give both video tributes and they're going to give uh, some personal tributes. So I'm going to kick that off, first of all, with uh, a governor that was the first Republican governor uh, of the state of Virginia. And that is Governor Lungwood Halter. Thank you, Kurt. And it's a great deal of pleasure for me to be here. Uh, particularly because of the long knowledge that I have had of, of the honoree. Uh, I did not overlap with him at Washington and Lee, but my tracks were there when his tracks were put there. And we have been uh, off and on together ever since. It really is a remarkable uh, experience to have served in any legislative body, but particularly this one, for 52 years. These folks who uh, have dealt with him on a more personal basis and uh, legislative uh, basis will tell you more about his experiences there than I can. But he came here in 1962. That was the year after Albertus Harrison was elected governor of Virginia. That was the year, in my judgment, that a major turnaround in the policies of this commonwealth was undertaken. Albertus made a, an inaugural address in which he phrased it a little bit differently, but I describe it as saying he was he was advising the Commonwealth of Virginia to stop looking over your shoulder and let's make some money. <laughs> we quit thinking about massive resistance in any official way, though the tracks of it were all over the Commonwealth at the time he and Lacey took office. But he, his recommendation was, let's look forward. He created the <coughs> Division of the Economic Development in the Governor's Office, and he <coughs> wrote the first commission that resulted in the creation of the community college system. These are the things that Lacey Putney 
has participated in from the very beginning. He has watched a, a major development in a major commonwealth. The population of the commonwealth more than doubled in those 52 years. The creation, the, the, the community college system was created. The four-year institutions uh, became major research four-year institutions that are making great contributions to the economic development of this commonwealth at this time. These are the experiences that Lacey has participated in, helped develop, <clears throat> particularly his role has been that of a balance wheel. He never flustered. He always was on top of all of the developing facts. He was progressive in the sense of recognition for the future of generations. It's a great tribute to have us gather and recognize those tremendous number of years and to congratulate you, Lacey, on a, an outstanding performance that makes every single one of us very proud. Thank you so much, Governor Holton. Next by video, we have Governor Charles Rock. Chuck Rock. Lacey, I'd like to be able to join you in person tonight in uh, celebrating this uh, historic milestone. Unfortunately, Linda and I will be up in Maine for a, a short vacation, but it has been long planned. But I'm delighted to have this opportunity to join your, uh, all of the governors with whom you have served in your distinguished 52 years in the General Assembly. Uh, you know, when you were first elected, uh, I was on active duty in the Marine Corps. Uh, John F. Kennedy was President of the United States. Uh, Lindsey Allman was Governor of Virginia. Uh, Blackie Moore was Speaker of the House of Delegates. And because they were having a short gas war on Route 1, uh, you could get gas for 11 cents a gallon. You <laughs> hadn't quite uh, achieved your all-powerful status uh, during the time we were together in Richmond, but you were certainly a, a man to be uh, consulted and, and uh, worked with, and I can remember any number of legislative meetings where uh, Al, Smith, Al Smith would just say, now make sure that we got uh, Lacey Putney on board for this particular uh, issue or legislation, whatever it is. And uh, I always uh, enjoyed working with you. Uh, your work on the uh, privileged in lectures earlier, but basically your, your work on uh, the uh, Budget Committee, uh, the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, you and I share the goals of uh, uh, education, uh, particularly higher education, and uh, fiscal responsibility. Uh, and uh, we were, I'm delighted to be able to work with you. I suspect that your record of some 52 years will probably stand the record uh, for all time. I don't think you're likely to have anybody be able to match that particular record. In any event, I want to wish you well. I hope that uh, you and all of your colleagues who are gathered with you tonight uh, have a good evening, and I wish you a successful uh, and long, happy retirement. Uh, good luck, and uh, God, Godspeed. One of my jobs as MC is I'm supposed to buy time between the video tributes. Next up will be Jerry of Allows, but it's interesting that we have both Republicans and Democrats. And I remember Lacey telling me the story that when he first got on appropriations, there was a Capitol policeman at the door that are actually guarding against members coming in the door. And the reason I tell that story very quickly is because I remember, and one thing I so much admire about Lacey is he was a man of principle, but he knew sometimes, hey, we make mistakes. And about three years ago, we had several Democrats vote against the budget appropriations, and he prided himself on consensus. And so he went to him and said, why did you vote against the budget? Because we just didn't think we had very much input. And what he instituted, which I thought was great, was where every Democrat member of appropriations then came 
who sat for three hours with us. We walked through the entire budget. They gave us their input. We brought the Democrat caucus up. We have a lot of Democrat members today. They really appreciate that. And the last several budgets have come out unanimous. And so, isn't it amazing to go from a Capitol policeman in front of the door of the corporations to where we are today? And that's because of this man. The next, the next person uh, to introduce is also by video, and that's Governor Gerald Jerry Block. <clears throat> I first met Lacey Putney about a thousand years ago. <laughs> I'm already a senior citizen legislator, a tall, handsome man, a striking figure, right out of central casting. And to me, he personified the biblical Methuselah. And he knew our early governors, Henry Jefferson, for example, uh, all on a first name basis. I always thought that you're not old until your regrets replace your hopes and dreams. And to me, Lacey has always been young. Young in heart, young in spirit, and young in hopes for Virginia's future. Lacey's public service is one of significant accomplishments of honor and integrity of principle and protocol. His sense of purpose, balanced by his wonderful sense of humor, has made him effective in the corridors of the Capitol. I watched Lacey closely when we served together on the House Appropriations Committee, counseled him on legislation when I was Attorney General, and worked with him on the transportation funding package when I was governor. When Lacey voted for transportation taxes in 1986, I favored immediate canonization of the gentleman. <laughs> or at least the placement of a historical marker in Capitol Square. Without question, most of us are familiar with Putney the legislator. I like Putney the person, the dispenser of wisdom accumulated over the years from watching the rest of us mere mortals. I used to capture some of his observations when we sat for days at legislative committee hearings, and here are some of the things that I pulled from my files. All good things come to those who wait and don't die in the meantime. <laughs> Your experience is something you don't need until you make a mistake. How about this one? The sooner you fall behind, the more time you will have to catch up. <laughs> and finally, if you must choose between two evils, pick the one you've never tried before. <laughs> Over the years, Lacey and I have never had a disagreement, although we came close once in the governor's office when I sought his counsel and consent on some matter. He demurred, saying, Governor, if I agreed with you, we'd both be wrong. <laughs> and so now, <laughs> all these years, Lacey Putney is leaving the General Assembly. It's hard to believe. You know, some people cause happiness wherever they go, others, whenever they go. But not Lacey, not this lawyer this legislator, this friend, not this gentleman from Bedford. It is said that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Lacey Putney has been one of those good people who has made us feel good about public service. And we wish him and Carmel good health in the years ahead. I wish I could be there in person to salute my good friend, the Honorable Lacey Putney. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce the governor that I came in with, uh, and I think one of the most historic inaugurations uh, 
Mm -hmm. L. Douglas Wilder, so Governor Wilder, if you'll come up and give a few remarks, it's great to have you with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's good to be here with uh, Lacey and his family and all of the legislators and colleagues uh, on, the, on the dais here. I was very impressed with everything that I've heard, so, so much so that I would rather just listen to other people <laughs> and uh, hear what it is they have to have said. I think Lynn Holton touched upon it in terms of going back and looking back and referencing Albertus Harrison. And I think it was uh, timely that he did so because as much as we like to talk about some things, it's very difficult to talk about reality and the reality of changing times and things that have changed and things that do change. Uh, Lacey came in at a time uh, serving in the house under the iron hand of Black and Moore. And that transcended into the velvet glove of my good friend John Warren Cook. And then the some would call it the wire brush of A.L. Philbin. <laughs> <laughs> but all of them, transcending figures among themselves, were involved with being certain that the people of Virginia were served. And when I look back at it and my relationship with Lacey legislatively, and when I was in the Office of Lieutenant Governor as well as Governor, <clears throat> It's always been cordial, but evolutionary. We all were able to learn from each other and to appreciate each other's views and to why we voted different ways or sometimes consistently with each other. And I think the biggest tribute that could be paid to Lacey is that he's been that transcending figure in Virginia government to not, as you said then, Alton, continue to look back, but to look ahead, to look forward. Virginia has set so many fine examples for the rest of the nation as to who we are as the founding state of the nation to send forth the leaders that we've sent forth, so much so that we need not live in the past but continue to look to the future. And people like Lacey, who blend in orchestration with viewpoints and change and imagination to see that take place, is what makes me feel good. I remember <clears throat> he called me the morning after I was elected, when I was still giddy. <laughs> up in the air, he asked me what I was doing. I, and I told him I was reading a book. <laughs> He hadn't gotten over it yet. I remember when I was running for statewide office in Bedford and running through the town and riding on cars and convertibles and beautiful weather and running into him and his beautiful grandchildren and they all were so cordial with me and to me and saying any numbers of good and nice things. I remember when I was likewise governor when we first started bringing in packets of legislators, Republicans as well as Democrats, to talk with them about what we had in mind, and Lacey was being among them. Many of them couldn't believe it, so what do you, you mean we are really being consulted? And I said yes, because this is a we thing, not a me thing. I'm more interested in what we as people do. And I've been fortunate to have known him, to have worked with him, and to call him friend. God bless you, and thank you for being with us. Thanks so much, Governor Wilder. Next, we have Governor Allen. I notice Susan's here, too, and it's quite a pleasure to have uh, him with us. He's the first one in the group uh, that actually I got to serve with as a legislator. I can tell you, we were fresh when we tried to make him the minority leader at the time. And of course, he had a great four years as governor. So, Governor Allen, if you'll come up and share a few words about Lacey. Thank you, Governor. Uh, 
Thank you, Leader, Governors, members of the General Assembly, friends all. It's wonderful to be here uh, to pay tribute to Lacey Putney. Uh, Susan and I wanted to come here. We went to the Carmela and Lacey's wedding naturally. Where are they going to have a wedding? They're going to have a Mr. Jefferson's Capital, uh, which was just a wonderful uh, reception, wonderful wedding. And uh, Lacey's someone that Kirk mentioned that I served with Lacey when we worked uh, together. But Lacey, when I got in the House of Delegates, I got elected in 1982. Lacey was already an old timer, he's been there for, for 20 years. Heck, I'm looking at this, I was eight or nine years old when you were running for the House of Delegates. <laughs> and uh, Lacey was, was already been there for 20 years. And uh, the point, I'm going to be very honest with you, when you get in the House of Delegates, when, we, when I was elected, we had Vance Wilkins, what was it? We had about 33, 34 Republicans. And, uh, and uh, we were on there on the seventh floor, and Lacey was on the seventh floor, and there would be these issues that would come up. Uh, and I want to learn about the unwritten rules. And all the legislators know the unwritten rules are just as important, if not more so, than the written rules. I see a bunch of heads nodding. So I would actually go to Lacey Putney's office, because I knew Lacey was an independent. He said, if, if he wanted to, if he, could, if he stayed with the Democrats, whether maybe, maybe after A.L. Philpott, but he could have been Speaker of the House. A very powerful position. I knew this was a person of principle. And I'd go to Lacey's office uh, there and ask to get him counsel, get counsel from him. His assistants, Bunny Gunn and, and Jim McIntosh, were always real friendly to me. In fact, Jim McIntosh ended up being a legislative assistant uh, for me um, in, in subsequent years. And, and I just looked up to Lacey Putney so much as a, a real man of principle. And in fact, I mean, people have said this, is uh, uh, central casting. I mean, he's like GQ of, of what you'd expect out of a, of a legislator. Look at his hair. <laughs> just perfect, immaculate shape. Who cares about the tie? Uh, it's always a Washington Lee color tie that he's, he's wearing all the time. But we, when, when I was elected governor, uh, Lacey was a big help then as well. And, uh, and all the initiatives, whether it was abolition of parole or, or welfare reform and a variety of other areas, but there were two key areas. And it actually is consistent with what Governor Belisles and Governor Robb and Governor Wilder have said as well. Two key areas where Lacey was just absolutely crucial as, a, as an ally, and that was, generally speaking, in higher education and in economic development and jobs. I mentioned was, uh, Kirk, you mentioned the, the tuition assistance grants. One of the key things we wanted to do is make sure college tuition was affordable. Campaign promise, freeze college tuition. Well, you've got to get that funding to the colleges and universities to do that. Lacey was key. The tuition assistance grant, and I was telling Susan, I said, gosh, Lacey was just a big advocate of tuition assistance grants, and he was absolutely crucial for independent colleges in that area. Then the other, in the area of economic development, it's a variety of different ways that Lacey was key in that. Now, you understood tourism was being an important, big ally and advocate for Poplar Forest, Mr. Jefferson's home, which is perfect for the Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson uh, Institute. Uh, they ought to name the Virginia Horse Center, uh, as far as I'm concerned, after Lacey Putney. And, and, uh, and also the National D-Day Memorial. Lacey was a big uh, advocate of the National D-Day Memorial, but that was a lot of folks working together on that. The other thing that Lacey understood in, in economic development is that we had to sell and promote Virginia. Uh, whenever we'd ask for funds for workforce training services, which was generally not brought up, and I know Jim and Bob and Doug, uh, you all know how important that is. Lacey was key on that. We doubled the number of enterprise zones in Virginia from 25 to 50. That had to get appropriations because of the mindset of the way they look at things, that lower taxes gets more investment. That's kind of strange to some folks in government. But it actually works, and you've got free to lay into the enterprise zone we created in, in Lynchburg. The other thing that comes up, and I know that uh, we used it a lot, as did my successors, and that is the Governor's Opportunity Fund. To get the Governor's Opportunity Fund to be funded, you need the Appropriations Committee to get those funds. Now, that doesn't close the deal. It does close the deal, but it's not how you win. You win by having lower 
taxes, reasonable regulations, right to work law, all the different economic costs. But the deal closing fund, the governor's opportunity fund was really important. And some folks were against that. And you still hear people today questioning the governor's opportunity fund. Lacey knew that that was very valuable for us beating out one of the Carolinas or Tennessee or Georgia or some, some other state. And indeed, we used it uh, for Bar Labs in, in Bedford County, which is, is now the largest private employer in, in Bedford County. It's now Teva, it's an Israeli-owned company. And for a Japanese company called Dynax, which located in Badatot County in Austin here, says it's either the first or second largest employer in Badatot County. Those are the reason I bring up Badatot and Bedford. Those are Lacey's uh, district or his county. So Lacey was just key in those areas as well. So Lacey, all of us are here paying tribute to you. Tribute to you for your consistent leadership. In so many ways, you're truly a most valuable player for people, regardless of party, you're an independent, but you're a man who always stood by principle. Susan and I look at you as, if you look at the General Assembly, whether it's the Senate or the House, you think of Lacey Putney. There's that, that rudder. You look at that statue of George Washington there in the rotunda. And what does that stand for? Integrity, honor, commitment to service to the people and also a self-discipline, an honor. That's what Lacey Putney can have a statue to him as far as I'm concerned in there because Lacey, through your many, many decades of service and sacrifices by your family, yourself as well, uh, you have truly made Virginia a much better place for people to live, make it more affordable for people to learn. There are more jobs because of you and all of us salute you. We salute you as the most valuable player. You're a Hall of Famer and will forever look up to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Governor Allen. Uh, I thought of those unwritten rules. And I remember when I got there, I never forget, I introduced my mother, which I thought was a really nice thing to do the first day. And A.L. Philpott, who was the speaker, came and just set the sergeant arms over and just chastised me. And I'm going, with the coffin corner, how many of y'all remember the coffin corner? All the Democrats and the yellow side, they're shooting rubber bands at each other, they're throwing spitballs at each other. <laughs> they are, if there's a dog bill, they're hollering yes and no. And I'm introducing my mother. And that was, that was one of those unwritten rules that I, I never could quite understand, so I had some thoughts with you. Uh, next is Governor Gilmore. Uh, Governor Allen mentioned higher ed, and uh, Governor Gilmore was a champion of higher ed. Uh, and of course, the same as for the no car tax. I had the uh, distinguished task one time of being one of his opponents uh, in debate prep. So I know how smart, how quick he is on his feet. So, Governor Jim Gilmore. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I uh, want to be sure to recognize my wife, Roxanne, who the first performer first lady. Well, Lacey, you throw a great party. You and the Thomas Jefferson Institute, I'm having fun already tonight. I've had a great time. I don't know about y'all, but I've had a great time. And I was uh, outside with all of you a few minutes ago, and uh, as everybody knows, uh, you know, it was uh, a real nice cocktail hour. And uh, I got a chance to see all my friends and colleagues, the governor, the former governors, and uh, uh, one of my favorites, of course, is my old pal, Doug Wilder. So uh, we we're sitting there talking. It's true, this really happened. We we're, we're sitting there talking, and uh, Doug says, you know, Jim, you know, I'm going to buy you a drink. <laughs> well, of course, as everybody here knows, right, it was an open bar, but... <laughs> well, I went back to the bar, and... Uh, and he said, just, you just tell the bartender your money, you know, your money's no good at the bar that I've paid for your drink. So I went back to the back and said, I have a glass of white wine, please. And uh, Governor Wilder said he paid for my, my drink. And uh, the bartender looked at me and recognizing a sucker when she sees one said, Wilder didn't say anything to me and that'll be $10. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad to be here, right? I, and uh, you know, I, I'm remarked about the fact that Mike said that uh, 1961 was the year that Lacey first uh, got elected. That's been a, a long time ago, Lacey. A lot of great service in between. A lot of history was in that particular year, 
What you probably don't know is that, that, uh, that Lacey is a child of the 60s. He was born, he was, uh, you know, went to the legislature in 1960, served all throughout the 60s. And so he's really a legislator of the Bob Dylan's first album came out in 1961. Uh, something that was a particular favorite of, of Lacey. <laughs> Lacey's first slogan during that time was peace, love, and pot, <laughs> which of course meant he preceded Ron and Rand Paul by all those years. That's good. Uh, that was the year that the first Target store was open. That was the year the first Walmart was open. Uh, and uh, that was the year the Dulles Airport was established, as a matter of fact, in 1961. That was the year Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points, and Lacey defended him that night. Uh, <laughs> And, of course, uh, my favorite team, the Yankees, beat the Giants that year. Um, folks, uh, you know, uh, Lacey started off as a Democrat, and he uh, stayed with the, the Democrats until he uh, became an independent in the, in the uh, late 60s. And, of course, uh, I think his fellow Democrats thought that during that time that when he shifted to Titus because he, he was on some sort of acid trip. And the word is that in 1969, uh, he went to Woodstock, and that's what caused him to want to make the change. Uh, and he stayed uh, as an independent, as a matter of fact, until he came off that trip in 1998 and began to caucus with the Republicans. And I was elected in 19. 97 and took office in 1998, and I, I just thought you all ought to know how pivotal he was uh, to me. Uh, folks, one of the goals that I had during that time was to elect the first Republican majority in the House of Delegates ever in the history of, of the Commonwealth. It was uh, something that uh, we had all worked on very, very hard, and uh, at the time, I think that it looked like uh, and, and felt like it was a, a strictly partisan thing. Actually, the goal at that time was to make a bipartisan state going into the new century in a sense that there would be full inclusion and an opportunity for both parties to really participate in government. Many people just don't remember how really bitterly partisan that period of time uh, was. And the goal there was to change uh, politics forever. Well, we worked very hard my predecessors did too, and we just couldn't quite get over the top. Uh, but we did a special election right at the beginning of my administration, and got, we won that special election and got just about to parity in the House of Delegates. But the Speaker refused to see the new Republican delegate. And they were going to organize the House of Delegates under the old regime because we were down one vote. Lacey voted with the Republicans to create parity, and the rest is history. Politics has never been the same. Governance has never been the same in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, since that time. And that took a lot of courage and fortitude, but it meant that Lacey was a genuine groundbreaker. And then on the second thing I would want to say is the, is the car tax cut. If any of you know that we not only ran on it, but the goal there was to deliver that car tax cut and to really do something really good just for regular working men and women in the Commonwealth of Virginia. A genuine tax cut for people who were uh, suffering under that, uh, that great burden. Lacey Putney was a patron on the car tax bill, and efforts were made to derail the car tax in the legislature that year. Many maneuvers were done. Believe me, I was sitting in the governor's office and trying to deliver on that promise. I remember every single maneuver that was done, and every time that an effort was made to derail the car tax, Lacey Putney voted for the car tax cut, and it became law. And many people benefited from that and continue to benefit uh, from it uh, to this day. Uh, so I would close by just saying this. Uh, many people say in America today, well, as Ohio goes, so goes the nation, as Indiana goes, so goes the nation, and one is very tempted, I think, from time to time to say, well, as Virginia goes, so goes the nation. The truth is that Virginia at this point is an integral part of the entire nation of the United States. The truth is, as the nation goes, so goes Virginia, and we should never forget that for one moment. So uh, we have to think 
about the challenges that we face as Americans today, the many challenges that we're, that we're facing, particularly the terrible economy that we have experienced and continue to experience to this day, the distress that we're seeing in the minority communities among unemployed women, among young people with degrees who can't get jobs. These are the challenges that we face today and there will need to be bold and decisive action. And when that time comes, and when America steps forward and regains its former eminence in the 21st century as it's had in the second, as in the 20th, uh, I can promise you that we'll be okay as long as we have not only great Virginians, but great Americans like Lacey Putney. Thanks so much, Governor Gilmore. Next is uh, Governor, now Senator, Mark Warner. I know he really wanted to be here tonight, but I don't think he's quite made it yet. So we're going to see a video tribute uh, from Governor Warner. Senator Warner, I guess now. Hi. I'm Mark Warner. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I want to join with all of Lacey Putney's friends from all over the Commonwealth to wish him well for his over 50 years of service. Virginia and to our country. I have to tell you, Lacey, as uh, somebody who's only been a legislator for five years and sometimes find myself pulling my hair out, I can't imagine how you were able to serve for over 50 years uh, in the legislature. But I have great respect for your service, and while we didn't agree on every issue, uh, you were somebody in my mind who represents the best in Virginia. So uh, I wish uh, you all the best in your years of retirement. You deserve it. And again, thanks you all for all you've done, not only for Bedford, but for all of the Commonwealth. Have a great evening. Okay, once again, it's my job to buy some time while we queue up the next uh, governor. So I thought I would mention this. A lot of you, Governor Gilmore mentioned baseball. A lot of you might not know that Lacey was really almost a professional baseball player. And I was talking to him tonight. He actually pitched against Don Lucan. That's the one that, uh, of course, was very famous. Lacey always likes to tell a joke. So, Lacey, I have your baseball joke with me tonight. I wrote it down. So, here it is. Uh, I think it's really good. There were two friends, Abe and Hank, who loved baseball and played together through high school and college. As they got older, they began to wonder if there would be baseball in heaven. This topic began to dominate the conversation, so they made each other a promise. Which everyone died first, will the other one know if there truly was baseball in heaven? Abe died first, and sure enough, came back to visit Hank. He told Hank he had good news and bad news for him. The good news was, there really was baseball in heaven. The bad news was that Hank was pitching the second game of the doubleheader on Sunday. <laughs> I just laugh more than you <laughs> Next, we have uh, Governor, now Senator Tim Kaine. Uh, who I also have the privilege of serving with, and Governor Kane is now going to give a video tribute to Lacey Putney. Good evening. I wish I could be with you tonight to celebrate the great career of my friend Lacey Putney. Lacey's service to the Commonwealth is really unmatched, spanning more than five decades in the General Assembly. No one in the history of the Commonwealth has done that. And I think it's going to be like Joe DiMaggio's a record of 56 games getting a hit, hit in each one. It's not a record that anyone will break. I think we all feel pretty confident of that. I had the chance to work with Lacey as Lieutenant Governor first, but then more closely uh, as uh, in my four years as Governor. And we worked on a number of important initiatives together. Uh, the expansion of law enforcement pensions was one, but the one that was probably the most significant was working together to craft the largest bond package for higher ed expansion in the history of the Commonwealth. I introduced a proposal at the end of 2007, uh, worked closely with Lacey and he and his team with their careful attention to the tail and their focus on the important need of higher education, made the product better as it worked through the legislative session. That's exactly what should happen when we do our best work. And by the uh, March or April of 2008, when we finished the bill and signed it together, I think both Lacey and I felt like we had done something very, very good for the Commonwealth. He has so many accomplishments, and it's not just accomplishments, it's the way he did it. Uh, Lacey is a person of, of courtesy and gentility and style. That was an example that uh, many needed to follow and still need to follow. And Lacey, I thank you for that. Uh, I, I know you're celebrating tonight with Carmela and your family. We're very, very proud of your accomplishments, and we're very grateful to you for your service. Thanks so much.
Finally, we have the current Governor Bob Adama, who I had the privilege of being seatmates with for five years, and I've always said he was the, I always thought he was the smartest guy in the legislature. He used to carry about 40 or 45 bills. That's why I put a bill on him, a bill limit. He's <laughs> but, uh, but he really was a tremendous legislator, and his governor, uh, of course, he's worked extremely closely with Lacey, because obviously a governor's budget, the governor will tell you, sort of dictates almost everything you do from all that's happened in K-12 and higher ed, VRS, which Lacey is an expert in. So excited to have Governor McDonald with us. So Governor, I'll have you come up and finish this up. Well, the reason I ran for governor is because Kirk put that bill limit on and new governors didn't have any bill limit, so it worked out pretty well for me because I have about 150 bills a year now. And it's, uh, Really nice to introduce those. What a treat to be with my uh, fellow governors uh, by video and here in person to honor a, a really great and distinguished Virginia, Lacey Putney. Uh, I want to thank Mike Thompson and all the people at the Thomas Jefferson Institute for, uh, one, keeping the memory and legacy of Thomas Jefferson alive, but to uh, continue to give us good ideas in the legislature, Mike, and I, I really appreciate that. And also, my friend Kirk Cox uh, for hosting tonight. You know, Kirk was, he did tell a true story. When I got elected to the legislature in 91, I show up in 92, I didn't really know anybody, but uh, on my right was Eric Cantor, and on my left was Kirk Cox. So the moral of the story is, if you want to be a majority leader, you need to sit next to me. That's uh, <laughs> kind of what I figured out after that period of time. I first wanted to Lacey, I wanted to clear up a couple of misconceptions about, you know, occasionally over the length of service you've had, people say some things that are not true, and I just want to make sure people know that uh, you were not a partner with Thomas Jefferson in designing the capital <laughs> of Virginia. It's a very bad rumor. And secondly, uh, Lacey uh, did serve during the war. Uh, in fact, it was 1950 to 54. Uh, he served in the Air Force during the Korean War. Many people think it was the Civil War, but it was not. It was actually as a blue suitor and served with distinction. I was really one of the first people in the Air Force because the Air Force just started in 19. 47, but he served with distinction. I think that passion for public service carried him just a few years later after law school and WNL into, into the Virginia legislature. Um, you know, Lacey's the kind of independent that we love. He caucuses with Republicans, he votes for Republicans, and calls himself an independent. We love Lacey Putney's kind of independent, and we'd like a lot more of him in the legislature. Uh, but he has maintained that independent status, and representing the people of Bedford, and yet uh, has done what he's always thought is right, regardless of what political party name uh, was put upon him. It's hard to, many have uh, reflected upon what life was like when Lacey got elected in 1961. I was 30 years behind in 1991 when I got elected. You know, John Kennedy was, uh, was president at that time. We had just booked the, had the first uh, space shot just a few years before that, I think the first uh, uh, Sputnik. There was uh, no uh, civil rights uh, law that was passed yet uh, in the uh, in the country, and uh, it was a it was a different uh, it was a different time. And Lacey has seen uh, remarkable change in the state and in this nation uh, during a uh, really incredible 52 years of service. And I reflect upon uh, just my own short team, uh, short 14 years in the House. Uh, many of you here have served longer than that in the legislature. But you know the sacrifices as a citizen legislature that you make uh, away from your family, uh, away from your friends. The more senior you get, it's not just two months, it's three, four, five, six. I see some of the heads nodding of people that have got 15, 20 years uh, here. And uh, I know that's been, that's been an immense hardship, and yet he did it so well and had such respect. And the people of his district continue to want him to serve. Uh, that uh, while he said after that first year he wasn't sure if he was going to run for re-election, here he is 52 years later, retiring. And uh, I'm so happy for Carmela and your kids that are here tonight, Lacey, to be able to celebrate uh, this, uh, this remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, I also want to say as I look back just during my three and a half years, uh, Lacey's been chairman of the Appropriations Committee. When I was in the General Assembly, I never had the uh, opportunity to serve on any of the money committees. I got assigned to courts of justice and other things like uh, that, so I wouldn't have any say over any money, I guess. But, uh, 
The um, Appropriations Committee, by the way, you never passed any of my budget amendments, Lacey. I'm still a little upset about that because I was a <coughs> legislator. But since then, you've made up for it because you did some remarkable things just in the last uh, few years uh, during my time as Attorney General and Governor. And I think everyone will certainly remember what uh, you just heard Governor Kane talk about, and that is uh, the game-changing investment in higher education, $1.8 billion bond package. Uh, back in 2008. That money is still being rolled out and is still making a remarkable difference in our higher education system in Virginia to really make Virginia the envy of the nation uh, with world-class uh, facilities. And you worked with us over this last couple of years to make the operational investments of about $400 million. So you see the last couple of years we've got the lowest tuition increases now uh, in uh, the last decade in Virginia. So his, his champion of higher education is something that uh, the young people of Virginia will benefit from now for uh, for generations to come, and I think that would be a great part of his uh, legacy. We also uh, realized this last year that uh, the retirement system, something that Lacey has been uh, really the leading expert in the legislature for now for many years, was uh, dramatically underfunded. Every state was dealing with that problem, and uh, Lacey has really led the way the last couple of years to finally get that under control and his uh, some of the legislation and the work that he did has helped to reduce the unfunded liabilities in that system now by nine million nine billion uh, dollars and uh, some of the new ideas that he and Senator Watkins in particular worked on now uh, will ensure that we're making the right investments and that we've got the creative uh, combination of a defined uh, benefit and defined contribution something that Lacey has uh, championed for quite some time. He also realized last year that uh, that gimmick of having our local governments write a $45 million check uh, every year to uh, the state wasn't a very good idea. And by the uh, sheer uh, willpower that he had, we worked together to be able to uh, get, rid of, uh, get rid of that. Uh, and so uh, I could go on with many of his accomplishments, but I'd say the reason that I think yesterday, Lacey, I was able to come in front of the Budget Committee and talk about uh, the surpluses we've had the last couple of years, the tripling of the rainy day fund and so forth, was really because of the remarkable leadership that you, Kirk Cox, and the others uh, have had. You've always been dedicated to fiscal conservatism. You realize that just because money's appropriated, it doesn't have to be spent. Uh, and just because the money's available, it doesn't have to be appropriated for spending. It can be put in a fact fund or the rainy day fund or other measures that will actually save resources for future uh, generations. The last couple of years, uh, I've taken a trip to New York uh, to visit with Bond Council, and uh, every year that I've invited Lacey, and every year I have screwed up Lacey's vacation with Carmella from uh, Cancun or some other godforsaken place that they were at. He'd always make arrangements uh, by uh, air or donkey or train to get to New York, and he's been just amazing. I can tell you, the reason we still have a triple A triple A bond rating today is one because of the good work Lacey's done in leading the appropriations committee, and second, he looking uh, these bond rating agencies in the eye with his vast experience and, and telling him, telling these leaders uh, the great things that we've done and we were going to do to resolve the problems that the bond rating agencies uh, saw. And I, I really do uh, appreciate that. Now, like some of the other governors said, I haven't always agreed with Lacey. In fact, the only time I've disagreed with Lacey is when he's been wrong. And uh, I can only think of really two times. Lacey, that that's occurred. You remember, remember both of them because you were very candid and direct with me about, about some of those things. Uh, one is, uh, is uh, he didn't think we ought to invest money in the Redskins. I really think he's a Cowboys fan deep down. I'm not really <laughs> sure of it, but I, you know, I had a few bucks I wanted to put in to try to bring those great NFC champions here to Richmond. And Lacey and I had a small disagreement. But uh, you see, I'm right, Lacey, because look at 160,000 people have come to Richmond to see those Redskins, so I'm sure it must have been right after. And the other time was um, I tried to put a little money in for a port amendment. You remember that, Chris Jones? We had a small, you and I, and Lacey had a small disagreement about that. But Lacey took the floor and I think gave a, a passionate, could have been more than a half an hour or so, speech about why my amendment was wrong. And, it was uh, it was a tough moment for me, but you know, Lacey's like uh, Lacey's like that insurance company. You know, when Lacey Button speaks, people listen, and uh, that has been true for 52 years now in the General Assembly, and he's been uh, really a remarkable uh, leader for a long time. I want to. I have a couple of very special memories though with uh, with Lacey. I've always found him to be uh, incredibly 
reasonable, honest, a straight shooter. When you have Lacey in your office and you talk about a policy issue and you're trying to find a common ground, you know you're going to get candor and straight talk uh, from Lacey. And I can tell you, for a governor, it's just, it's, there's no better blessing than that. If you know exactly where somebody stands, you know uh, how, how to deal with it. But the most, uh, the biggest thing I think I've been impressed with Lacey is uh, his incredible love for the people that he serves. Uh, he's never forgotten that despite all this uh, time up here and being, a, being the Speaker of the House and being Chairman of the Appropriations Committee and all the other accolades that he's had, that he represents uh, people from Bedford, Virginia. Uh, and that's the great home of the 29th Division, the Bedford Boys. Uh, I remember having some uh, really private time with Lacey uh, to visit that D-Day memorial uh, a couple of hot summers ago when I was campaigning for governor. And I remember walking around with him, and I think just a reporter, maybe uh, just a couple other people, and I could see the passion in his voice, his love for the distant memories of those Bedford boys some 65 years earlier, uh, and the fact that he was so proud that the National D-Day Memorial would be right there in his community and something that he was going to continue to support uh, to be able to honor the legacy of the freedom fighters from his hometown uh, that meant so much uh, to the liberty of our, our country and the liberty of Europe and, uh, and the rest of the world uh, some, some seven decades earlier. And so that's the Lacey Putney that I really know and love and that uh, most of you have probably got a chance to see. At the end of the day, he's a public servant. Uh, he loves that idea of service to others. He is the ultimate citizen legislator that Jefferson envisioned uh, when he wrote those foundational documents. And Lacey, um, on behalf of all of us here tonight, the 8.2 million Virginians, I've got a presentation I'd like to make if you'll come forward. And uh, what I have here is a uh, very nice plaque that's got about 50 whereases, and they all say, Lacey Putney's a really cool guy. <laughs> and, uh, it sort of recounts your very, very distinguished career that many have agreed would be a record of accomplishment that is unlikely to be uh, matched or beaten for uh, any time in the foreseeable future. But it, uh, I hope uh, in short order, Lacey, it encapsulates some of your uh, amazing accomplishments, uh, your remarkable public service to the people of Virginia, and is a small sign of the love and admiration that all the governors and all the people here tonight and all the legislators have uh, for you. And we wish you and Carmel the best as you go into retirement. Godspeed.
And as she's putting his cheese and fish bait in the bag, he's still talking and she's filling his bag. When she finished, she handed it to him and said, Well, are you working now, Mr. Tuck? <laughs> said that she cut him down so quickly, never indicated to anybody that he was important. Folks, I, I am not capable of responding to all that I've heard here tonight. Um, I have some notes, and my bride has told me for the last couple of dates, they said I'm crazy if I get up here and talk about all of that, and I'm not going to. I don't know how I'm going to call it out, but I'm going to get rid of some of it. You don't want it. You didn't come to hear me tonight. <clears throat> I want to thank, first of all, everyone associated with the Thomas Jefferson Institute, all of the people that had anything to do with arranging this event tonight. I know that uh, Mike and Charlie, that they've been working in I want to thank them all. If I have accomplished anything in my few years here, let me tell you it's because of the support and cooperation of all of the legislators that I'm looking at right now. I didn't do it. I, I worked with them and got it done. And folks, let me tell you, none of my accomplishments would have ever gotten to first base with our staff. Our staff on the Appropriations Committee is second to none in my books in this country under the leadership of Robert Vaughn. Robert Vaughn knows more about the fiscal part of government than anybody in the state of Virginia. And my guess is that whichever one gets elected governor, they're going to come after him and want him for Secretary of Finance, but he'll stay where he is, I think. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Most of what you hear when we are in session is dull and dry. I now have an idea how Winston Churchill felt when he was receiving an honor that he didn't think he deserved. That's exactly the way I feel tonight. He said, I am deeply gratified. I am awestruck that you have chosen to honor me in this fashion because I do not think I deserve it. However, if you have no misgivings, neither will I. <laughs> when I look into the audience and see all of you people with government experience and the governors and what have you, I'm sure that every one of you knows as much and more about my subject than I do. It reminds me of the old gentleman in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, who miraculously survived the great Johnstown flood, and he became obsessed with talking to everyone he met and telling them about it. He just had to talk about it. When he got to heaven, he asked St. Peter to arrange a time for him to speak to everybody. He wanted to tell them about the great John, Johnstown flood. A few days later, St. Peter came around and told him that he had arranged, had arranged for all of the people there in heaven to be out on cloud nine the next day at six o'clock. But he said, I want to warn you, one of those in your audience is going to be Noah. <laughs> you know, when you're as befuddled as I am after all this good stuff, you hardly know what, which way to go. I know that Yogi Berra says when you get to the fork in the road, take it. So I guess that's what I've got to do. Much of what we do is dull, dry, and boring, but Occasionally, we have a lighter moment in the legislative process. I don't know how many of you know Ray Garland. Ray was at William F. Buckley in the house when he was there. I've never heard of a vocabulary like it.
Back in those days, we frequently had night sessions. We would adjourn till about 8 at night, come back after having dinner. And you'd be amazed how many of my colleagues took the opportunity to add a little liquid courage while they were One night, Ray Garland was wound up. He was regaling them all the house. He went on and on. Members began to yawn. He used every 16-inch word in the dictionary. When he finished, Jim Thompson, who was the floor leader, stood up and said, Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the distinguished gentleman from Hillsville, Delegate Giesler, chairman of the Republican caucus, would take the floor and interpret for the rest of the people that what Greg Allen just said. <laughs> well, nobody, nobody expected Giesler to respond, but he stood up, extinguished his cigarette, we all, most of us smoked in those days on the floor. And he said, Mr. Speaker, it is abundantly obvious that the gentleman from Rono is grossly inebriated by the exuberance of his own verbosity. <laughs> he immediately took his seat, and you can imagine what an explosion of laughter and applause we had in that <laughs> I wish, I wish some of y'all could be there. When I tell you when I'm talking like this, how dry it is, and I want you to know that I'm not going to talk long, but it give you an idea of how dry it is when you try to talk to a group like this. Our legal fraternity in Lexington invited Dean Muse from T.C. Williams Law School to come to Lexington as a luncheon speaker for our legal fraternity. When Dean Muse arrived, first thing he said was, you folks should have checked a lot more than you did before you invited your luncheon speaker because I'm known as the driest person who ever walked. He said, let me illustrate. He said, I was walking across the campus a small bridge over part of the lake at West Hampton, and he said, I saw a bunch of students at the other end of the bridge. When I got there, I asked what was going on. And one of the students said, Dean Muse, we dropped a camera down in the lake, and you are the perfect person to go down and retrieve it. He said, why in the world? Would you think of asking me to retrieve it with all you young folk? And a young man said, Dean Muse, I am in your Monday, Wednesday, Friday lecture, and I know that you can go down deeper, stay down longer, and come up drier than anybody on the face of the earth. <laughs> recapping some of the things that have occurred during the 52 years that I had been privileged to serve, but it would take a lot more time than I want to, to dwell on it. Uh, during the years that I've been fortunate to be down here, we saw the rise and the fall or the end of the so-called bird conservative up. Uh, called it the organization. It was not limited, the membership and participation was not limited to legislators. Probably one thing that extended its longevity and its quality was the fact that local constitutional officers were intensely supportive of the organization. They frequently ran as a team. The um, reason that they were so loyal to the Bird machine was one of some of the Bird senior's best political allies, closest friends, was the chairman of the state compensation board that fixed the salaries as the bird of all the constitutional officers. <laughs> uh, the, um, I, I looked, I tried my best to find the, 
beginning and the ending of the bird machine, but it's not easy to pinpoint either one. I am sure that a lot of people who liked it thought it was there for a long while, and those who challenged it, dared to challenge it, thought it stayed forever. But I think the beginning of the demise of that organization came around 1964 during the presidential election when Johnson was running for re-election and Barry, Barry Goldwater was the candidate for the Republicans. Senator Byrd Sr. had not supported a Democrat candidate for president since FDR in 1936. And now everyone is wondering what's going to happen this year in 1964. Well, Senator Byrd said nothing and kept his golden silence. The chairman of the state Democrat Party, Congressman Watkins Abbott, did not endorse the man. Nor did former Governor Bill Tuck endorse him. Not many of the big boys did. What happened was, toward the end of the campaign, Governor Harrison endorsed the president in the last few days of the month of September. And the next thing that happened, the governor and Lieutenant Governor Mills Godwin boarded the Lady Bird special train and went across Virginia with the First Lady and stopped in six places. One of them was Norfolk, where there were 20,000 enthusiastic people there to greet the Lady Bird train and all who were there. The, uh, there are many examples in the political world that the informed social uh, political writers will tell you was the beginning or the, the end or the peak of that bird machine. As you know, when Senator Byrd resigned from the United States Senate, Governor Harrison appointed his son, Harry Jr., as Senator to, to take his place. And Harry, Harry Jr., you know, a few weeks ago died. And while we were at the funeral, uh, maybe three weeks ago, believe it or not, some of the old friends began to reminisce, talking about the bird machine. Anyway, I, uh, I don't know whether dig in here and throw this stuff away, but I'm not going to cover it all. Uh, uh, just a minute, bear with me. Look, maybe I can re remember some of it. The name Henry Howell might come to mind of some of you. Henry was certainly the emerging leader of the liberal wing of the Democrat Party. And he ran on one occasion. He won in a three-way race. But when he ran, he ran against John Dalton. And the, all of the newspaper writers in our area were predicting another victory for Howell. But that's not the way it turned out. Dalton won by more than 158,000 votes. And as you know, he, all, he did a great job as governor of Virginia. I'm going to stop boring you to death and not going to go through all this crazy political stuff here. But tempted to tell you that I do not know how to respond to all of the good things that I've heard here tonight. And I, words are not adequate to express 
to Charlie and to Mike and all of them at the Jefferson Institute, my deep appreciation for taking the project of recognizing my 52 years by creating a fellowship in my honor. I, I cannot believe that it's happening. I am grateful, cannot express to you adequately how grateful I am. And every one of you governors, I thank you for your words. I can't believe you've taken the time to come here for this occasion, but I deeply appreciate it. And I'm going to leave, I'm going to stop right now, except to say, we are going to be witnessing change in the political landscape everywhere from now on, just like we did in the past. But I am convinced that the people of Virginia will continue to elect public officials, public servants, who put principle ahead of party. And I think that's going to happen in Virginia will continue to be one of the best states in which to locate a business or grow a business. And I think much of that is attributable to these gentlemen here who serve with distinction as governor of the greatest state in the country. Thank you very much. So much, Lacey. I'm going to have one of the ladies stand, and that's Carmella. Let me quickly wrap up. I want to do thank three other people who really worked hard on this event, did a lot of the coordination. That is Carly Nelson, uh, Katie Gaskins, and Kate Savage. So, Chairman, is we have not only the legislators here tonight, but so many others have written you personal letters. They put them in the scrapbook about how much we think about you. Uh, I was leafing through, and some were just great. So we want to present uh, this portfolio of letters from probably over 50 members of the legislature. Let me close with, first of all, thanking all the governors for coming. We, we know how busy your time is, and I think it takes a special band to come out. Let me thank all the rest of you for coming for this wonderful event. Uh, it was just a blessing. Lacey, just thank you. It's just not simply going to be the same without you. So thank you so much, and y'all have a wonderful evening.